Hi, thank you for having me. I'm actually uh, very happy to be part of this conference. Now, um, I want to uh, start my talk by first uh, stating that um, my perspective is going to be as a cardiologist and how we work up uh, patients with tricuspid regurgitation. And I will be showing uh, transthoracic imaging as well as transesophageal imaging. Um, and then the second thing is I would really encourage everyone to go and look at Max's talks. We actually coordinated and some of the topics he's covered, including tricuspid valve anatomy and mechanisms of secondary TR, I'm not actually going to spend too much time on. Um, and then I'm going to direct you to go in and look at his talk. Uh, here are my disclosures. So I'm going to start first with this first case, and this is a 54-year-old gentleman who actually presented um, about four or five years ago uh, to his family doctor with right forearm, forearm pain. He was actually examined, and they did auscultation during the time, clearly pre-COVID when we were allowed to have stethoscopes, and he was actually found to have a murmur. Um, they ordered the transthoracic echocardiogram, and it reported severe TR, moderate RV enlargement, and preserved RV systolic function. Um, he was then referred to the Toronto General for an actual opinion on what to do about him. When you actually speak to him, he was New York Cardiac Association Class 1 as well as CCS Class 1. He had no significant past medical history. There's no history of rheumatic fever. Um, and then his only uh, other, other um, habits were smoking. And he was actually on no medications. So let's look at his echo. So this is a transthoracic echocardiogram. Uh, this is your apical four-chamber view over here. Here's your short axis view uh, with the aortic valve over here. And then this is a um, RV inflow view. And the reason I'm showing these images is, whoops, is that first you're going to have these to be able to compare with to the transesophageal echocardiogram graphic images that I'm going to show later. But what you want to notice is first the RV and RA are both dilated. There is actually a lot of tethering and you can see these tethered cords on the um, on the leaflets and that's causing a lot of problems. And it's tethering not only at the edges in the clear zones but also in the rough zones that you can actually see on it. And there wasn't actually by, if you look on the apical uh, four chamber view, criteria met for Epstein's abnormally. So this wasn't an Epsteinoid or a Epstein, a Freudenfrust of a Epstein valve. Um, but it was ended up being called what's called a, a dysplastic valve. There's something congenitally abnormal about this valve. And in, because we see an RV enlargement, our A enlargement wanted to make sure there was no shunt. He actually had a negative bubble study. Now, when you look at quantification of the mitral regurgitation severity, uh, the vena contracta was uh, over eight millimeters. You can see that there's triangularization of the inflow uh, or the outflow, uh, sorry, the TR regurgitation. The density is actually quite dense. And then there's a dilated IVC and there's flow reversal in the hepatic vein. Now, we don't normally do transesophageal echocardiograms, and part of the reason for that is the location of the tricuspid valve. The images on surface study tend to be much nicer than they are on transesophageal uh, echocardiogram for most patients. So we actually, as cardiologists, tend to send people for tricuspid regurgitation surgery uh, to surgery with just a transthoracic study. Now, our volumes of transesophageal echocardiograms for tricuspid valve assessment have actually increased because of the newer tricuspid clip as well as uh, tricuspid percutaneous valve assessment. So we're now doing more of them. But in reality, the imaging is actually much tougher uh, for us uh, to get the images. And some of the times when you do these transesophageal images, we have spend a lot of time in the transgastric views to get good views of the anatomy and what's going on with the tricuspid valve. And when we're in the mid-esophageal views, because of that aortic valve sometimes shadows that septal leaflet, uh, uh, what we end up doing is we end up doing these low esophageal views instead of the mid-esophageal views. And you can see this is one of them where you've lost the left atrium here and you've got this coronary sinus, you're very posterior, in order to bring out the anatomy of the leaflets and actually be able to uh, see it much better. And so as you can see, here's the trans, um, transgastric, the short axis view of the, the leaflet with the source of the uh, regurgitation jet. Here's a long axis view uh, with, of the leaflets once again. You, you can appreciate all the tethering in the extra cords and the abnormal cords, but it's much harder on this transesophageal echocardiogram than it is on the transthoracic. And you can see these tethered cords once again on the um, mid, uh, low esophageal views here. So one of the first questions I was going to ask is what is more common, primary or secondary TR? And the answer will come up later in my slides when we discuss this. And then the second thing is how many leaflets can a tricuspid valve have? And the questions are two, three, four, or all of the above. So back to our case, though. Um, 
his blood work was normal. Things that we follow up, including liver function tests, and that tends to be normal. Uh, BNP has not been demonstrated, but we use it in a lot of uh, valve disease, and that was actually negative in this patient. And then the INR showing the liver function was actually normal, was uh, within normal range too. Given his asymptomatic status, he was actually followed clinically with serial echoes and cardiac MRI. And in 2016, his RE volumes were enlarged, if you look at it, it was about 171 milliliters per meter square, which is uh, quite uh, much larger than sort of the upper cutoff is about 90, 100 milliliters per meter square, depending on your gender and age. Um, and then RV and systolic volumes, once again, were large, and the RE, RVEF was 57%. Now, I'm going to caution you that when you, similar to much regurgitation, an RVEF of 57% is probably not normal in someone who has severe, uh, severe tricuspid regurgitation, simply because of the offloading of the right ventricle. So we followed him up. He actually had our MRIs yearly, and they were actually, his values are quite stable from 2016 to 2017. And then in 2018, there was further dilatation. So at that point, I had a discussion with the patient and said, listen, your function is probably not normal, mildly reduced, but you're starting to dilate again. At that point, he was open to going to surgery, and so he went to surgery. And if you see the images on the left are the, um, transesophageal echo images that I had shown you previously. And then the images on the right are the images that he had intra-off. And as you can see, he actually went and he didn't have a valve replacement. What he had was a repair of his valve and that there was probably at least a mild regurgitation in the post-op period. Um, they went back on pump a couple of times to repair it and this was the best that they could do for him. Um, how's he doing right now? He's doing well. MRI was repeated after, and we could tell that there was an effective reduction um, in the regurgitation severity because the volumes actually decreased. Now, I, as I pointed out, the RVEF was probably not normal for surgery. And you can see that after surgery, his um, MRI uh, revealed that his RVEF was truly about 39%. So he's been left with some RV dysfunction. Um, but clinically, he's been doing well and has not actually had any signs or symptoms of right heart failure. So what are the key points I'm actually going to cover in my next few slides? Well, first, uh, most TR is actually secondary, not primary, like this patient. Um, and then tricuspid valve imaging, I'm going to make the argument that transthoracic echocardiogram is complementary and probably um, probably more informative for a clinical cardiologist instead of transesophageal is there's lots of challenges in doing transesophageal because of the location of the tricuspid valve. And then quantification, one of the things you have to be careful about, TR quantification is actually different um, from that used for much regurgitation. And then uh, here's my slides uh, going through some of these um, things. So first, most TR is actually uh, secondary. So the case I presented is a minority of cases. About 25% of people will have primary leaflet abnormalities causing their tricuspid regurgitation. And of those, a lot of them will be congenital. And then of those who have acquired primary leaflets, uh, they're going to include patients with carcinoid, myxomatous, uh, myxomatous disease, Endocarditis is a large one that we see nowadays. And then pacemaker leads are, are also increasing. And for the transplant population, RV biopsy. The secondary uh, or functional regurgitation is ones that you see a lot. These patients who go in for their surgeries with uh, mitral regurgitation plus tricuspid regurgitation or aortic uh, stenosis with uh, with tricuspid regurgitation, those are the secondary or functionals. And then there's a category of others, which are people call, uh, who are post op now, tricuspid valve assessment, when you're assessing it, the um, sort of the breakdown for the major, uh, the types of uh, tricuspid regurgitation uh, breakdown into primary, secondary, and isolated tricuspid regurgitation. And this is a nice table published in Jack that actually talks about the pathology that you actually want to look at in order to classify and identify uh, what the uh, mechanism and pathology is. Um, history is going to help you with a lot of uh, a lot of the times figuring out why the leaflets look the way they do. Um, but things that you want to look at are leaflet, the subvalvular pathology, the annular uh, size and um, function, whether what the leaflets themselves are doing, how they're tethered, and then what the RA and RV um, are actually uh, how they appear. Now. I've shown you before, tricuspid valve imaging is probably transthoracic. 
uh, for uh, most of that. And it can give you all this information on both the cause of it. You can see what the leaflets are doing, what the, um, what the papillary muscles are doing, what the RA and RV are looking like. Um, you can also get a good idea of assessment of severity of the tricuspid regurgitation. You're able to get measurements of the angular di um, di dimensions, uh, the leaflet tethering, um, and also you get assessment of the pulmonary pressures and um, right ventricular function. And you can also look at what's going on with the left side of the heart. Now, one of the limitations of 2D echo assessment of tricuspid valve is that your cut planes uh, may be a bit misleading. So here is sort of a, a cartoon showing the aortic valve in the center with the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve over here. And you can actually get an apical five chamber view uh, with the aortic valve or with the coronary sinus. And it can show you that the leaflets, um, I mean, you're cutting through different parts of the leaflet, whether it be the anterior septal or the posterior septal leaflets. And I'm gonna show you um, using a 3D cut plane what that looks like. So here we have the short axis valve, here's your mitral, um, valve and here's your tricuspid, the anterior posterior septal leaflets are all labeled. And here you're cutting through, this is gonna give you a four chamber view. You're not too anterior or too posterior. You don't see coronary sinus and you don't see aortic or LVOT. And so you've got a true four chamber view, but in here you're actually cutting through for the tricuspid valve, you're cutting through the septal and posterior leaflets. Once again, you do a different bit of an angulation here. You've got a four chamber view. Once again, there's no LVOT, there's no coronary sinus, not too anterior, not too posterior, but here you're cutting through the septal and anterior leaflets. So Identification, uh, identification of the leaflets um, on 2D echo can actually be a little bit tricky. And this is where 3D ec echocardiography actually helps a lot because you can see all three leaflets, you know exactly where the pathology is. Um, you can look at it from the RV perspective with the uh, typically you're supposed to have the uh, intraatrial septum or the septal leaflet at six o'clock and then you can identify your anterior posterior leaflets. And then you can look also from the right atrial perspective and you can see your posterior leaflet and the anterior leaflets. And you can also cut through uh, to your, um, in a sort of a, a um, non on fast view to actually see the leaflets themselves with uh, 3D. And one of the things we have realized with 3D is that uh, we actually don't really um, identify the number of leaflets very well with 2D. Um, here's an example of a valve that actually looks bicuspid um, or bi leaflet. Here's one that traditionally was tri leaflet valve. And this one could almost be argued that that might be a quadricuspid or quadra leaflet. Um, tricuspid valve. And in patholog pathologic samples um, where they take serial patients and look at their tricuspid valves, there can be actually up to six leaflets seen on the tricuspid valve. And we really don't appreciate that when we're looking at uh, a 2D image. And so I think one of the values of 3D is that we actually really understand the morphology of the tricuspid valve a little bit more. In addition to um, uh, seeing the morphology, now Similar to, to 2D planar imaging with 3D echocardiogram, 3D transthoracic, once again, is still better for identifying the, um, or looking at the tricuspid valve compared to 2D. 3D TEE, you can see the tricuspid valve anatomy about 85 to 90% of cases. Um, with 2D, uh, 2D TTE, you're looking about five to 10% of cases. And then with 3D TEE, you're looking at about 65 to 70 percent um, to be able to clearly see it and I um, because there's issues with dropout the leaflets are tend to be much thinner and just the location makes it tough to get a clean image to get that uh, volume set. Now here are some examples with 3D echo about pathology here. So this is our patient that I showed you in our case uh, showing the dysplastic valve and you can see the different cords coming off the leaflet tips and where they're attached to. Um, this is a carcinoid valve. You can see the thickening of the leaflets um, of the leaflets and you can see that the restricted motion here. This is a patient with functional, the annulus is dilated, the leaflets are all pulled apart. And then this is a patient with pulmonary hypertension where there's been remodeling and it almost looks like it's a bicuspid. Um, there was a beautiful example of this uh, in one of the morning talks on my regurgitation about how you can take 3D echo and then you can use the multiplane reconstructions to actually identify pathology. So this is a patient who actually has a septal leaflet um, uh, flail and when you actually localize the 3D data set you can actually identify uh, that where that flail is coming from and what that leaflet is looking like. 
Uh, one of the biggest things we have actually learned also is the appreciation of the role that pacemaker leads play in tricuspid regurgitation. Um, you can clearly see on this uh, 3D image that the pacemaker lead is sitting in the commissure here and that there's no impingement on the leaflets and there's good co-optation. Here you can see that pacemaker lead is going going through. We're sitting in the right uh, ventricle, looking up, here's the interatrial septum, and you see that that's holding back that septal leaflet, and the anterior and posterior leaflets are trying to co op there, but you're going to get a bit of a gap here, and that's where you're going to get tricuspid regurgitation. Um, you can also identify lead position in this nice study um, in about 90% of patients using 3D surface echo um, for identifi identifying, identifying, uh, identifying the case cause of the tricuspid regurgitation. Um, another thing is there's a lot of talk with mitral regurgitation when you go into the operation operating room, you want to know if the tricuspid annulus is enlarged because you're going to do an annuloplasty at that time. One of the things is um, you can misidentify the size of the tricuspid annulus simply because of your cut plane. So here we've got a four chamber view and you're going to measure that. But if you look at the matching uh, 2D echo, you can see that um, you're cutting this way instead of the true long axis and you're probably under measuring how big it is. And that may account for why in the ORs there's a 60 millimeter cutoff versus the 2.1 um, centimeters per meter square cutoff used on echo. Um, 3D obviously can be measured and uh, shows uh, a little bit more um, accurate uh, in terms of the size of the tricuspid annulus. I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about uh, TR severity assessment. And as you look here, um, it's actually a, a multiparametric assessment of the cause of the tricuspid regurgitation. And if you can see here, you can see here um, on the table um, that you're looking at many parameters and then you're integrating all of that to decide if there's severe or mild TR. And then if you're not, you're kind of in the probably moderate criteria. And when you look, you're looking at the color jet, whether or not it's small, if it's wide, you're measuring the vena contracta width. Um, they're looking at the PISA if you measure it. And then you're looking at the continuous waved um, tracing and then hepatic flows and inflows as well as RA and RV size. And then you try and um, sort of uh, put all of that together to decide whether or not you've got mild, moderate or severe. But one of the things I want to point out, and it's a very small line at the bottom, is that clinical experience in quantitating TR, so using the regurgitative volume, using EROA, is actually much less than mitral and aortic regurgitation. And so a lot of this is actually not very well validated. But there is a bigger problem with how the guidelines are describing tricuspid regurgitation. There's a lot of assumptions made but, and it's based on what we know about the mitral valve and we're adopting it to the tricuspid valve. And one of the things that we have realized with assessments for tricuspid clip procedures is that the tricuspid valve is not the same as the mitral valve. They have different orifice shapes, they have different subvalvular apparatuses, and they have different ventricular uh, shapes, yet we assess them the same way. So that's why a lot of the people who do a lot of tricuspid valve interventions, such as Becky Hahn, um, they all, uh, they have recommended using this new criteria for where we include this in beyond severe tricuspid regurgitation. We include definitions for massive and torrential tricuspid regurgitation because we know that those cutoffs actually have prognostic value um, and decreasing going from torrential to severe, uh, while it may seem um, uh, counterintuitive, actually makes a difference in how patients do. Um, one of the last things I want to point out before I move on to the next case is that 2D echo underestimates um, the severity of tricuspid regurgitation compared to 3D. And this is for a couple of reasons. First, it's rarely the regurgitation jet is a rounded shape because of the tri-leaflet um, coaptation. It may be elliptical or stellate in actually um, in shape, especially in secondary TR. The other thing is a lot of the cases um, in secondary TR result in tethering of leaflets, which means that your PISA um, calculations actually have to have a correction uh, for this leaflet tethering. Um, TR often has eccentric jets. Volume status and respiratory variability actually affect your TR assessment. And that being said, while 3D is more accurate, they're still not ready for prime time. And so there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on tricuspid regurgitation assessment, both 2D and 3D. So now I'm going to move on to case number two here. 
Um, this is a 71 year old gentleman who has a two to three month history of increasing fatigue, shortness of breath on exertion. Uh, his past month history is for bypass surgery with aortic valve replacement uh, in 2012. He also has chronic atrial fibrillation with a pacemaker and he's got adrenal insufficiency on cortisone. His medications are listed here. Uh, he's got atrial fibrillation on his ECG, and his blood work shows that his BNP is actually a little bit above our cutoff of 100, uh, but it's not quite meeting criteria for heart failure, which would be over 500. The uh, hemoglobin is a little bit low, white count platelets are normal, his electrolytes are normal, more importantly, his creatinine is normal, and his left liver function tests are normal. Uh, and because he's on uh, warfarin, his INR is a little bit elevated. Now here's his uh, transthoracic echocardiogram and an image from his transesophageal, so you can see that his RV is enlarged. Um, his function actually is a little bit reduced. So you, there's a mildly reduced TAPSI as well as S prime. And if you look, there's uh, on his transesophageal echocardiogram, you can see there's a dilated right atrium. There's a pacer wire here. Here is our his tricuspid leaflets with a gap. Um, if you look at his hepatic vein flow, you can see that there is systolic flow reversal. And then we'll, let's take a closer look at his transesophageal echocardiogram. So here's our uh, low esophageal four chamber view. You can see that pacemaker leaf is, um, lead is coming very close to that septal leaflet, uh, but the jet seems to be coming from a direction different uh, from the, the lead itself. Um, and then here is a nice view we like using for the clip because it lets us see all three leaflets is sort of the equivalent of a BICOM view on the mitral valve. And you can actually see that we're cutting through and then getting these sort of, it's an apical four chamber view. And we can see that this leaflet is not quite impinging that septal leaflet. And then we cut it through both the, um, the um, anterior and the posterior leaflet as well as the septal leaflet to get an idea of what's going on in this long axis. Um, apical view uh, for the leaflets. So you can see that it is very challenging to see these thin leaflets in these dilated hearts and what's going on. And you can see that there's a pacer leaf going through, but it's not really, in, there are views where you can see that there's a gap and um, there might be a possibility that we could actually um, uh, clip the leaflets on these views. Now here's a 3D echocardiogra um, echocardiographic image from TEE showing the pacer leaf. And a lot of times when we take these leads, out in the OR, you can see that they're wrapped around a little bit. Um, and you can see here's the pacer lead. It's actually mostly in that commissure here. So this is the uh, RV uh, perspective. You're sitting here on the septum, there's your pacer lead, and then your um, uh, anterior and posterior leaflets here. And then this is a right atrial lead, and you can see that curve of the leaflet as it goes down into the tricuspid valve. Um, so the next question is gonna be, what is the operative mortality rate for isolated TR? Um, and then I'm going to go forward to, he was actually uh, declined to go for surgery. He wasn't very interested. He has been assessed for tricuspid clip and he's going to be going forward with that. And he hasn't had his procedure yet because that was uh, deferred because of COVID. Um, the key points here is late TR post um, left heart surgery actually occurs frequently. It's something we see and mortality for tricuspid valve surgery is higher than other valves. And I'm going to show you the data now. And so I'm going to review all of these. So we have appreciated over the last um, five to 10 years that TR is actually bad, isolated TR um, in particular. We used to think that it wasn't uh, something to be concerned about, but we know that independent of age, function of the ventricles, um, it actually has a poor prognostic, uh, is a poor prognostic sign. And one of the things we are more appreciative now that we have interventions uh, non-surgical non, um, interventions for cuspid valve is that uh, actually can develop over time. So here's a study looking at mitral valve repair patients, and you can see this also in the aortic valve literature, that, uh, that tricuspid regurgitation that wasn't significant at the time of surgery can develop. And if you look at this longitudinal follow-up of over 20 years of patients who went over um, and had mitral valve, that at one year, there's about 5% who have moderate or severe tricuspid regurgitation, but by 20 years, almost 21% of patients in this group um, had uh, tricuspid regurgitation. And risk factors for this include time, age, and atrial fibrillation, which is a major cause, and preoperative heart block, and then the New York Heart Association functional class before surgery actually is predictive of this. What is the mechanism? Well, in patients who've had previous left heart surgery, they may have mild RVRA dilatation secondary to pulmonary, hy pulmonary hypertension, which leads to annular dilatation and remodeling um, that 
remodeling of the annulus as well as the left right ventricle then distorts the tricuspid valve anatomy of the cords and papillary muscles. You end up with more tricuspid regurgitation. This volume overload from TR then creates a cycle where you get more RV and RA dilatation, and then you go into this negative cycle. And I just want to point out that whether or not you have a primary uh, tricuspid valve abnormality or secondary, you end up in this negative cycle of RV volume overload and more TR. Now, TR after left heart surgery, um, the results are mixed, but most of uh, the conclusion has been that it's actually portends poor prognosis. Even in the mitral clip literature, we're now seeing that if you have residual TR or developed TR after your procedure, uh, you do actually have um, a worse prognosis from it. And there is so some contradictory literature suggesting that it's actually maybe not tricuspid regurgitation, but the RV dysfunction that's actually uh, more predictive of survival. This is one study that was published showing this. But there are a lot of people who criticize the study um, beyond the fact that it's a single center observational study, but there wasn't actually information um, or accurate uh, echo data on the timing or appearance or degree of TR. And the determination of RV dysfunction in the setting of significant TR is also difficult to assess as we've covered before. And the etiologies of the left heart, uh, heart surgery um, was unclear in these patients. Now back to the guidelines. So what do the guidelines say for patients who have TR after left heart surgery? Well, it's a 2B indication, so not a very strong indication recommending it. And part of the reason for this is because you have to not have severe pulmonary hypertension or RV systolic dysfunction. Um, now we go, my last few slides are just going to talk about tricuspid valve surgery. First of all, tri isolated tricuspid regurgitation surgery is rare. If you look at the numbers of mitral aortic uh, surgeries, they're much higher compared to tricuspid surgery. And most of the surgery is actually tricuspid repair and in the context of having mitral valve operations. Uh, it's rarely performed by itself. Now, what is the mortality for isolated tricuspid surgery? So in the STS database, you can see the mortality is coming down, but well. it's 0.8%. And if you do replacement for tricuspid valve, it's even higher. It's about 13% versus 9.5%. And these are the numbers for what the mortality rate for mitral valve repair, surgery or replacement versus repair are uh, for mortality rates. So you can see that it's significantly higher. And if you have a reoperation for tricuspid regurgitation after left, your, your mortality is about 9%. studies. So overall, this is a case of late TR due to RV and RA remodeling and mortality for reoperation is very significant. And so the, the question then is going to be that you may end up seeing these patients earlier in their disease processes to try and reduce this and for other um, non-surgical procedures. Thank you. Thank you for that outstanding uh, presentation and beautiful uh, 3D uh, images that uh, you shared with us. And there's a couple of questions uh, from the audience. First is, uh, what's your point of view for indication for a tricuspid valve intervention in TR secondary to left heart disease? So Max was gonna uh, talk about that um, and actually show a case example of that. So the literature right now is, um, is arguing that, especially out of the European studies, is arguing that you should fix the tricuspid valve at the same time as you do mitra clip. Um, procedures. And in the ORs, there's a large uh, NIH funded trial that's doing mitral, um, that argue, that is looking specifically at when you should, how you should fix the tricuspid valve with mitral regurgitation. Now, after tricuspid, uh, after left heart surgery, uh, when you, should you fix the tricuspid valve? That was the question they asked. Um, uh, in our assessment, we tend to be, I think, more aggressive. If you wait till they have liver dysfunction, if you wait till they have renal dysfunction, it's too late. Their mortality is already going to be very high. We are very bad at estimating what RV function is. The Europeans are probably more advanced than the American guidelines in that they recommend as a almost a, if I recall correctly, a class one indication. If you have RV enlargement, you should consider fixing it. So they're not even talking about RV failure or assessing function. They're just saying RV enlargement. And in um, and I think we're leaning towards that, especially now that we have triclip available and percutaneous tricuspid valve. So we're tending to become more aggressive on that. 
Okay, and the second question is, um, can you comment on the long-term outcomes post tricuspid valve repair uh, versus replacement and what are the major uh, risk factors and common issues? So I think it depends on why you're having your tricuspid valve done. So a lot of the patients we see tend to be the young IV drug users and they are given, um, if they're, they may be repaired, but most, sometimes they're because of the extensive uh, nature of the vegetations that actually get them to surgery, they're replaced. And a tissue bile prosthetic valve on the tricuspid side is actually not very good. It will probably degenerate very quickly is, is the feeling of um, our, uh, a lot of our, um, our uh, interventional colleagues that uh, we've talked to about this. Um, but um, so we try to delay people as, as, as much as we can, but once again, then they get to surgery and they have RV dysfunction after uh, surgery. So there's a, it's this fine balancing act, but I think um, part of the high mortality that you see those eight, 10% mortality ranges are because we move along when we're looking for this, when you wait for it and you see this renal dysfunction, you see this liver dysfunction, we're probably waiting too long for a lot of these patients. And so I think for both a surgical side as well as the percutaneous side, we're taking them earlier. And I think um, there, I saw a question flash out. So what exactly, when would you actually take someone? If they do not have symptoms, but they have RV enlargement and I confirm it with MRI if possible, I would probably refer them for intervention if they're willing. Okay. And in that first patient that I showed that had the dysplastic valve, he had already had a dilated RV when I met him. He wanted to wait and see what happened. And then the minute it continued to dilate, we said we should go. And that's why he went. But there are some patients I have who um, they come in and they don't want to wait because what you, well, you're waiting for it to get bigger and you don't know if they'll come back. I think there's a bit of, sorry to interrupt. I think there's a bit of yeah, stricter reasoning because we often see people hesitant to intervene on tricuspid valves because of the poor outcomes, but that we're kind of creating those poor outcomes by waiting too long. Right. So, um, right. So the liver dysfunction, a lot of, a lot of the times if they get liver dysfunctions, the surgeons do not want to operate on that because of the high mortality with the liver dysfunction and then renal dysfunction and permanent dialysis afterwards. Um, so it becomes this negative, uh, negative cycle. Um, I have a lady that I followed who had tricuspid uh, valve repair. Um, but the problem is hers was in the setting of atrial fibrillation and we waited, um, and, um, and, uh, and she never, she only had mild heart failure and the argument was that we should continue to wait, but then she ended up with significant RV dysfunction after, um, after we um, had surgery. Uh, but then people who are more aggressive and want to go, you see they come back and their RVs are nice um, and their volumes come down. So I think, um, I think we tend to wait too long. But it's a hard thing to, 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 to argue because of the mortality data um, to, with a patient and say, I think you really should go. Another question just came in. Um, when should we intervene in the tricuspid valve and pulmonary endarterectomies? Now that's um, that's a little bit outside of, uh, of I, I don't actually know the data on that, but I would say that with pulmonary hypertension, in patients who get treated, uh, I have a series of patients I share with the pulmonary hypertension clinic here. You have to, because the RV is very sensitive to pressure and changes in volume status. You have to wait to see if they can bring down those pressures with treating the endarterectomy, um, with endarterectomy or um, anticoagulation. Because when the pulmonary pressures come down, the RV is sometimes very responsive and remodels in a positive way. And then when the RV remodels, the TR goes away. And so you don't want to intervene when you don't have to. So my argument is that I would wait to see if they're responsive to treatment and then go in. And I think this is especially true as the tricuspid technology develops for percutaneous interventions and we have more options. Thank you very much again for your uh, participation. It seems that there's uh, no more questions. So, uh, um, oh, there's one. Uh, just one last question, Wendy. Uh, what's the role of RV strain right now in assessing these patients? Where are we at? 
So our restraint, our restraint is still, I think, a more of a research tool than we use it regularly. Um, I think for left-sided disease, there's a lot more literature supporting its use, and I, I suspect either this next coming AHA guideline or the, the one after that is going to recommend using strain for uh, mitral valve disease. But in terms of tricuspid valve disease, it is still probably not enough data to recommend its use. Um, and, and I think, um, but I think that data will eventually probably get there. We just got one more and, um, and then we'll move. Uh, so if there's any specific selection criteria for triclips or any functional TR can go uh, for triclips. Right, so Max was gonna cover this, but in the, in the triclips, uh, um, we do, first of all, you have to have you have to be able to image the tricuspid valve with TEE um, imaging because that's what's going to guide your procedure. So I think if you can't get good images with tri uh, with transesophageal echocardiogram, it's probably not going to be a very doable procedure for the tri uh, for the tricuspid clip. And I think that's just one of the challenges you have because of the location and the imaging. Um, and that is also why there's a lot of transgastric views that are done. Um, as well as the low esophageal views. Now, in terms of the imaging or the um, the um, uh, the actual criteria, that is still being developed. But the major one is that you don't want a gap greater than seven millimeters, okay? Uh, because the arms of the clip are about a centimeter, so you have to be able to have long enough that you can pull things together. Now you can clip from a commissure and move inward. So as long as you have a view that you can see that it's it's not so big, you can start clipping from the side and move towards the center and close off a commissure. And sometimes you bicuspidize a valve to do that. Okay. The second thing is if you have a pacer lead, because a lot of these patients that are being referred are because they have pacer leads going through. If you have color jet coming from an area where there is not the pacer lead going through the valve, Okay, so you want to have, you don't want to jail the, um, you don't want to jail the lead. Okay, and then you want to see then what the anatomy looks like, where that jet is coming from, that is away from the lead. Okay, the, um, in some patients we have, if they are accepted, we actually put in an epicardial pacemaker lead system, we take out the transvenous lead, and we put in an epicardial system and then send them forward for clip. Okay, the criteria, the views that you kind of want to do are you're going to need this um, short axis view where you have the aortic, it's about so between 40 to 60 degrees, you have the short axis aortic valve um, at the level of the cusp where you can see all three cusps, and then you have the um, bicommissural view, and then you biplane through each of those leaflets as I showed you, and then you want to have this almost, um, uh, this um, inflow view where you see IVC coming into the um, into the uh, um, right atrium and then the, the tricuspid valve. It's kind of like between a, not quite the short axis, not quite the four chamber at zero. It's, it's about 30 degrees. And the reason you want that is that's a delivery view. Okay, so um, you wanna get that view also. So those are the views that you need um, to do it. And then when you're in those views, swing in and swing out, sweep through the valves to find where the jet is coming from, away from any pacemaker leads and looking for the leaflets themselves so that you can grab it. And then one last thing, I've talked a lot about the triclip. We do percutaneous, or in Toronto, there is percutaneous uh, valves. We have jailed ICD leads with these percutaneous valves. Uh, literature shows so far that um, in, in 100 patients done that um, there's no misfunction to the ICDs or pacemaker leads that are jailed by these percutaneous valves. However, help us if there's ever an infective endocarditis on the pacer lead because we would not be able to take those patients out, uh, those leads out right so that's one of the things that hasn't come out in that literature yet but it's similar to the taver valves that get infected it's a massive reoperation to to do that in someone who's already not been a candidate for something else right so 